The universe is a truly fascinating and awe-inspiring place. With its seemingly endless expanse of stars, galaxies, and other celestial bodies, it's easy to feel small and insignificant. However, despite its vastness, the universe has always captivated the imagination of humanity. From the earliest stargazers to the most advanced scientists of today, we have always been drawn to explore the mysteries of the cosmos. Where's the edge of the observable universe? And what's beyond? What lies outside the boundary of the universe? Join us as we embark on a journey into the abyss of this universe, where darkness itself fears to exist. The Big Bang tells us that at some point in the distant past, the universe was hotter, denser, and expanding much more rapidly than it is today. The stars and galaxies we see throughout the universe in all directions only exist as they do because the universe has expanded and cooled, allowing gravitation to pull matter into clumps. Over billions of years, gravitational growth has fueled generations of stars and the formation of galaxies leading to the universe we see today. Everywhere we look, in all directions, we see a universe that tells us the same cosmic story. But part of that story is the fact that the farther away we look, the farther we're looking back in time. The universe hasn't been around, forming stars and growing galaxies, forever, according to the Big Bang and the observations that support it. The universe had a beginning. In the early stages after the Big Bang, the universe was filled with a variety of ingredients and it began with an incredibly rapid initial expansion rate. These two factors, the initial expansion rate and the gravitational effects of everything in the universe, are the two head-to-head -head players in the ultimate cosmic race. On the one hand, the expansion works to push everything apart, stretching the fabric of space and driving the galaxies and the large-scale structure of the universe apart. But on the other hand, gravitation attracts all forms of matter and energy, working to pull the universe back together. Normal matter, dark matter, dark energy, radiation, neutrinos, black holes, gravitational waves and more all play a role in the expanding universe. The expansion rate began large, but has been decreasing as the universe expands. There's a simple reason for this. As the universe expands, its volume increases, and therefore the energy density goes down. As the density drops, so does the expansion rate. Light that was once too far away from us to be seen can now catch up to us. This fact carries with it a huge implication for the universe. Over time, Galaxies that were once too distant to be revealed to us will spontaneously come into view. It may have been 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang occurred, but with the expansion of the universe, there are objects as far away as 46.1 billion light years whose light is just reaching us. All told, if we were to add up all the galaxies that exist within this volume of space, we'd find there are a whopping 2 trillion of them within our observable universe. As enormous as this number is, it's still finite, and our observations don't reveal an edge in space in any direction we look. The amount of time that's passed since the Big Bang, the speed of light, and the ingredients in our universe determine the limit of what's observable. Any farther than that, and even something moving at the speed of light since the moment of the hot Big Bang, will not have had sufficient time to reach us but all of this will change in time. As the years and aeons tick by, light that was unable to reach us will finally catch up to our eyes, revealing more of the universe than we've ever seen before. Today, we see the universe as it exists 13.8 billion years after the hot Big Bang. Most of the galaxies we see are clumped together in galactic groups, like the local group, and rich clusters, like the Virgo cluster.
separated by enormous regions of mostly empty space known as cosmic voids. The galaxies within these groups are a mix of spirals and ellipticals, where a typical Milky Way-like galaxy forms an average of about one new sun, like star per year. But as we look farther and farther away, we start to see how the universe grew up to become this way. As we look to greater distances, we find that the universe is slightly less clumpy and slightly more uniform, particularly on larger scales. We see that galaxies are lower in mass and less evolved. There are more spirals and fewer elliptical galaxies. On average, there are greater proportions of bluer stars, and the star formation rate was higher in the past. There's less space between galaxies, on average, but the overall masses of groups and clusters is smaller at earlier times. It paints a picture of a universe where today's modern galaxies were created by smaller, lower-mass galaxies, merging together over cosmic timescales, building themselves up to become the modern-day behemoths we see all around us. The universe, at earlier times, consists of galaxies that are physically smaller, lower in mass, closer together, larger in number, bluer in color, richer in gas, with higher rates of star formation, and with fewer proportions of heavier elements, as compared to today's galaxies. But as we go farther and farther away, to earlier and earlier times, this gradually changing picture begins to transform abruptly. When we look back to a distance that's presently 19 billion light years away, corresponding to when only the 3 billion years had passed since the hot Big Bang, we see that the universe's star formation reached its maximum, about 20 to 30 times the rate at which new stars are formed today. An enormous fraction of supermassive black holes are active at this time, emitting enormous amounts of particles and radiation due to the consumption of surrounding matter. For the past 11 billion years or so, the universe's evolution has been slowing down. Sure, gravitation continues to collapse structures, but dark energy begins to work against it, coming to dominate the universe's expansion more than six billion years ago. New stars continue to form, but the peak of star formation is in our distant past, and supermassive black holes continue to grow, but shown at their brightest earlier on, with a greater fraction of them fainter and inactive today than during these early stages. As we go to greater and greater distances, closer to the edge defined by the start of the hot Big Bang, we start to see even more significant changes. When we look back to distances of 19 billion light years, that corresponds to a time when the universe was just 3 billion years old, star formation was at its peak, and the universe was maybe A0.3 to A0.5% heavy elements. But as we close in on 27 billion light years away, the universe was only 1 billion years old. Star formation was much smaller, as new stars formed at rates approximately a quarter of what they'll be later on at their peak. The percentage of the normal matter that's made of heavy elements plummets precipitously to 0.1% at an age of 1 billion years and to just 0.01% at an age of around 500 million years. Rocky planets in these early environments may well have been impossible. Not only was the cosmic microwave background significantly hotter, it would have been at infrared rather than microwave wavelengths, but every galaxy in the universe should be young and full of young stars. There are likely no elliptical galaxies this early on. Going farther back than this really pushes the limits of our current instrumentation, but telescopes like Keck, Spitzer, and Hubble began to take us there starting in the 1990s. Once we go back to distances of approximately 29 billion light years or farther, corresponding to times where the universe was 700 to 800 million years old, we start to run into the first edge of the universe, the edge of transparency. We take for granted today that space is transparent to visible light, but that's only true because it isn't full of light-blocking material like dust or neutral gas. But at early times, before enough stars had formed, 
The universe was full of neutral gas and hadn't become fully ionized by the ultraviolet radiation from these stars. As a result, a lot of the light we see is obscured by these neutral atoms, and it's only once enough stars have formed that the universe becomes fully ionized. This is, in part, why infrared telescopes, such as NASA's newest flagship mission, the James Webb Space Telescope, are so crucial to investigating the early universe. There's an edge to where we can see in the wavelengths we're familiar with. At distances of 31 billion light years, corresponding to a time of just 550 million years after the Big Bang, we reach the edge of what we call Ryanization, where the majority of the universe is mostly transparent to optical light. Ryanization is a gradual process and takes place unevenly. It's like a jagged, porous wall in a lot of ways. Some places see this Ryanization happen earlier, which is how Hubble spotted its most distant galaxy ever. But other regions remain partially neutral until nearly a billion years have passed. James Webb has now taken us even farther, showing us galaxies as far back as 330 million years after the Big Bang, where they still appear large, evolved, and are not quite pristine in terms of the elements that are present within them. There must still be stars and galaxies out there beyond even what the Webb telescope has shown us so far. Beyond those limits of what our current telescopes can see, however, we can still measure the indirect signs that stars have formed. Through the emission of light from hydrogen atoms themselves, which only occurs when stars form, ionization occurs, and then the free electrons recombine with the ionized nuclei, emitting light in the aftermath of that. Right now, we only have the indirect signatures of this signature of early star formation, although there are many that dispute the validity of this signal, indicating that young galaxies existed as early as 180 to 260 million years after the Big Bang. These proto-galaxies formed enough stars that we can see the first hints of their existence buried in the data corresponding to a distance of between 34 and 36 billion light years away. Although our current telescopes haven't seen these galaxies directly, the great expectation of many astronomers is that a long enough deep field exposure with James Webb will reveal them. However, there are likely still sources of light and the first ionized regions of space in the universe going back even before that. The very first stars of all in the rare regions that grow in mass density the fastest are expected to come about between 38 and 40 billion light years away, corresponding to times just 50 to 100 million years after the Big Bang. Before that, the universe was only dark, full of neutral atoms and radiation from the Big Bang's leftover glow. Going back even farther, we fully expect there to be additional edges of interest. 44 billion light years away, the radiation from the Big Bang was so hot that it becomes visible. If a human eye were to exist, it would be able to see that radiation begin to glow red, similar to a red-hot surface. This corresponds to a time just 3 million years after the Big Bang. If we go back to 45.4 billion light years away, we come to a time just 380,000 years after the Big Bang, where it becomes too hot to stably maintain neutral atoms. This is where the leftover glow from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, originates from. If you've ever seen that famous picture of the hot and cold spots from the Planck satellite, this is where that radiation originates. And before that, 46 billion light years away, we come to the earliest stages of all, the ultra-energetic state of the hot Big Bang, where the first atomic nuclei, protons and neutrons, and even the first stable forms of matter were created. At these stages, everything can only be described as cosmic primordial soup, where every particle and antiparticle in existence can be created from pure energy. However, what lies beyond the frontier of this high-energy soup remains a mystery. We have no direct evidence for what occurred in those earliest stages, although many of the predictions of cosmic inflation have been indirectly confirmed. The edge of the universe, as it appears to us, is unique to our perspective. 
we can see back 13.8 billion years in time in all directions, a situation that depends on the space-time location of the observer who's looking at it. The universe has many edges, the edge of transparency, the edge of stars and galaxies, the edge of neutral atoms, and the edge of our cosmic horizon from the Big Bang itself. We can look as far away as our telescopes can take us, but there will always be a fundamental limit. Even if space itself is infinite, the amount of time that's passed since the hot Big Bang is not. No matter how long we wait, there will always be an edge that we'll never be able to see past. In other words, the universe is big, really big, bigger than the most we can comprehend. The observable universe extends from the Earth to the horizon of the cosmic microwave background. When the light of the cosmic background was emitted about 13.8 billion years ago, it was only 42 million light years away, but because of the expansion of the universe, that horizon is now more than 46 billion light years away. Using that definition, the known universe is about 93 billion light years in diameter. As large as that is, it's only the portion of the universe we can observe. The total universe extends beyond our horizon. Just how far it goes is an interesting question. There are indications that the universe extends far beyond what we can observe. The universe we see has a fairly uniform distribution of matter. Sure, matter clumps into galaxies, and those galaxies clump into clusters of galaxies. But on a scale larger than about 300 million light years, those clusters appear randomly distributed. In other words, it is homogeneous and isotropic. If what we observe were the extent of the universe, then we would be basically in the center. Since we see about the same amount of mass in all directions, the gravitational pull from all that matter would basically cancel out. But for a galaxy on the edge, it would see a great deal of matter in one direction and basically nothing in other directions. Gravitationally, it would be pulled toward the center of the universe. Because of dark energy, this universe wouldn't collapse upon itself, but it would mean that galaxies would tend to clump toward the center. Since gravity is a curvature of space-time, this would distort the overall shape of the universe. What we observe, however, is that the universe is flat. At the very least, this means an observer at the edge of our horizon must also see a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Given the flatness limit, that would mean the total universe is at least 400 times larger than the observable universe, but it could be much larger. Another point of evidence is the fact that the cosmic microwave background has an almost perfectly uniform temperature. There are small fluctuations of temperature throughout the background, but the overall temperature is the same in all directions. The thing is, it shouldn't be. The cosmic microwave background was emitted when the universe was about 380,000 years old. At best, that means that only regions of space within a radius of 380,000 light years would have any way to reach thermal equilibrium. For anything more distant, there simply wasn't enough time for the regions to communicate, even at the speed of light. When we look at the cosmic background in different directions, we can see different regions that couldn't have reached the same temperature. They were simply too far away from each other, and yet they have the same temperature. What gives? The dominant idea is known as early inflation, Basically, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe entered a short period of extremely rapid expansion. In a brief moment, the universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the power of 60 before settling down to its current rate of expansion. While we don't have direct evidence of early inflation, it does agree with several observational aspects. According to the inflation model, the observable universe was roughly the size of a quark before early inflation and about the size of a grain of sand afterwards. If the size of the total universe before inflation was the distance light could travel since the Big Bang, then the current universe is about 10 to the power of 27, larger than the observable universe. In other words, comparing the observable universe to the entire universe is like comparing a grain of sand 
to the observable universe. It could be much larger, perhaps even infinite. Of course, all of this assumes the cosmos doesn't have some kind of strange topology. Since space and time can warp and weft, one could imagine a universe that loops around to itself, being finite in volume, but infinite in distance. Imagine a cosmic version of the surface of the Earth. It has a finite area, but due to the Earth's curvature, you could travel in a particular direction forever, simply looping around the Earth over and over. In cosmic terms, that would mean a beam of light traveling through space would eventually find itself back where it started. If the universe were closed and smaller than the observable universe, we would expect to see multiple versions of the same galaxies. There have been studies looking for periodic fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that would indicate such a closed universe effect, and they've found no evidence of such a thing. If the universe is truly closed, then it must be at least 78 billion light years in diameter. Of course, there is no reason to presume the universe has such a closed topology, so that lower bound should be taken with a grain of salt. So the short answer for the size of the universe is that it's huge, likely very, very, very huge, possibly infinite. On the other hand, note that the universe is not only vast, but also mysterious, filled with wonders beyond our comprehension. Only 5% of the universe is normal, observable matter. The remaining 95% of the universe is stuff that we can't see, don't yet understand. An extraordinarily vast portion of the cosmos is still unknown. Despite the technological advancements of the last century, even with computers at our fingertips and the worldwide internet and space-based observatories mapping the far reaches of our universe, there is still so much that we don't understand. Worse, the problems facing our picture of the universe are not limited to what we can perceive. Our mind and the culture in which it was formed condition the way we explore the universe. Because of this particular conditioning, we have mental blind spots for the cosmic phenomena that run counter to human intuition and understanding. For instance, Turner claims that the mind is predisposed to see things as statistically significant when they might not be. We erroneously perceive patterns in the spacing of stars and of the planets in the solar system, seeing them as though they were arranged. Furthermore, there are other properties of the mind that get in the way of seeing the truth. Consider, for instance, our belief that massive objects must take up space. It is not a direct relationship. We accept that a piece of lead is more massive than a pillow, even though the latter is larger. At the extremes, however, we expect some positive correlation between the two. The extreme physical environment of a neutron star then poses problems. As Michael Strauss suggests, the star is so dense that a thimbleful of neutron star material has the mass of 70 million elephants. We cannot help but wonder, where is all the mass? Obviously, we are blinded by being human when we look at something larger than the human experience. It becomes further apparent when we are confronted with counterintuitive phenomena like white dwarves and black holes. White dwarves decrease in size as they become more massive, says Joshua Wynn. And for black holes, all mass is compressed to zero size. While we cannot see the black hole, giving the phenomena a name allows us to imagine it. The same could be said of dark matter and dark energy. As with the previous analogy, language provides a means of overcoming our initial blindness to interact with these cosmic phenomena. After all, the universe was not built for the human mind to understand. When we look up at the night sky, we see only a tiny fraction of what is out there. It is the task of the astrophysicist to develop a picture of the universe despite our overwhelming blindness. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching 
and we will see you next time.